basically know from the work she's been doing over the last decade, uh, trying to save the healthcare system in Canada, one of the few things that people will still defend and we haven't completely lost yet. Uh, I traveled on one trip with uh, Natalie and was just, uh, I was really impressed with just the underground work that she's doing, the amount of organizing in all these small communities around the province and literally hundreds of people uh, actually brought into politics through this. So Natalie's one of the, the best organizers I've ever met. Um, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Who remembers uh, that during the last election campaign in Ontario, a company called Allegra um, got a story out in the Globe and Mail, do you remember this, saying that they could do uh, hip surgeries cheaper than um, public hospitals, not for public not-for-profit hospitals could? Remember that? And, um, and the story ran in the Globe for days, and uh, the Conservatives picked it up, and it was brought into the legislature, and the health minister was grilled. They really thought they had him at that point, and the health minister was grilled over and over again, why won't you allow this private, for-profit, multinational company to contract um, to take these clinical services um, from hospitals because they can provide them more cheaply? And the Globe and Mail, even after we provided them with information that, and the health ministry did also, that one, the pricing um, that was being used was, was misleading because, um, because Allegra Health actually had what, what was known actually before Allegra Health was uh, the Don Mills Surgical Clinic. It's, it's operating rooms, they're actually in an office building just up the street from our offices. And, um, and they don't have the capacity to deal with um, certain levels of, um, of anesthesia. They're only allowed to do certain levels of anesthesia. And like most private for profit or fast track specialty hospitals, um, they can't deal with patients who are complex. Because if a patient is about to code, you need to have an ICU and the staffing ratios and all of that, uh, the equipment and so on, there. So, um, so they're, not a they're only able to deal with the ambulatory patients, the ones who can walk in, have the surgery, walk out. Those are the cheapest fastest patients and of course the pricing for them would be less than the more complex patients that have comorbidities or have you know or are risk of coding while under um, that uh, public hospitals have to deal with that the Globe and Mail refused to print even after that information was provided to them during the election campaign but interestingly we would never really have been at a point where you could compare prices for knee surgeries in such a manipulative way um, had it not been for the moves that the Liberal government had done in the years preceding the government to start bringing pricing into hospitals, something that most people in Ontario don't realize and probably most people in Ontario wouldn't think was a bad thing. Pricing in and of itself doesn't seem like something that you should oppose. It seems like fairly normal. We're used to that, so used to it in all of the facets of our lives. Um, but in fact, bringing in these market systems into hospitals um, has already wrought a lot of uh, hardship and um, uh, reductions in quality and access to care and, um, and real downward pressure on um, the wages and working conditions of the workers in healthcare. Um, Pat Armstrong, who's a professor at York University, I think very eloquently describes how privatization uh, works in its different elements. And so she says, Privatization is a number of things. It's the transfer of the ownership um, of uh, formerly um, public and not-for-profit assets uh, and services uh, into private for-profit hands. It's the transfer of payment for health care from the collective, from pooling our taxes, pooling our risk, and redistributing that income out in uh, free health care services for all but based on need rather than the ability to pay, transferring um, the payment from the collective to the individual. Um, and usually, of course, when you're sick or you're elderly, you're least able to work and earn money and pay for health care, even if you could pay. But, I mean, nobody really could afford catastrophic care uh, anyway. You know, the upper middle class, the middle class, the working class, the poor, no, none of them could afford that anyway. Um, downloading of the responsibility for care from the collective again to the individual. And with that, um, shift from paid work to um, transfer of the responsibility to volunteer work, mainly women 
in the home who are already being required to put more hours than ever into the workplace in order just to stabilize family incomes. And the other, and the last thing, which is something that many people don't think about, but it's the adoption of corporate modalities, like the modalities of the marketplace within the public service itself. And that's sort of where we get um, the major lessons for Britain. I mean, I think we understand, to a large extent, I think Canadians understand that two-tier healthcare will mean that most of us have to pay more, um, that the, the wealthy will jump the queue, and um, that everyone else will get bumped back, and, and all of those sorts of things. Maybe not the majority of people, but people have a sense of that, I think. Um, but I think that people don't realize that adopting these kind of corporate modalities in the public service really does um, uh, change uh, complex care functions that don't fit into market modes um, and really uh, does um, dismantle the, the core values and principles upon which the public health care system uh, rests. Um, and so, so we have seen all of these types of privatization happening in Ontario. We've seen um, the privatization of a whole range of services, that is transfer of ownership. Um, in the introduction of P3 or public-private partnership hospitals, in the um, in the uh, creating a dichotomy between clinical and so-called non-clinical services in hospitals, hiving those off and privatizing them in a number of facilities, in the ever-lengthening contracts of those uh, private uh, privatized services, in the transfer of work out uh, of work and care out of public not-for-profit hospitals. Um, and, um, and in every case, um, the new capacity that has been built in the so-called community sector has been privatized. So under the Harris government, they closed about uh, 9,000 critical acute and chronic care hospital beds, all in not-for-profit hospitals, transferred them out, built 20,000 new long-term care beds, the majority of them owned by private for-profit companies, and shifted patients also into home care. Um, and brought in competitive bidding. And so the Red Cross, the VHA, the VON, the not-for-profits that had provided home care before were forced to compete against Bayshore, Health Inc., UCARE, WeCare, AllCare, Paramet, all of these uh, for-profit um, home care agencies. A very purposeful attempt to transfer ownership of, the, of uh, health care over to private for-profit hands. We've seen um, the, uh, the transfer of payment for health care um, through endless, usually, cuts to hospital services, shrinking the scope of what Medicare uh, covers, so that now physiotherapy has been privatized in most communities, um, chiropathy or foot care for people with diabetes, um, speech pathology, uh, a whole host, audiology, a whole host of um, services, women's clinics, <coughs> Aboriginal health clinics, you know, moved out of hospitals, closed down, uh, what they call in hospitals now load shedding, just cutting the services in hospitals and never replacing them anywhere else. And if you can get them at all, you'd have to pay privately in, 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 uh, in a private clinic, if that exists. In many areas of the province, it doesn't exist. Um, we've seen, of course, the downloading of responsibility of care work, particularly in home care where uh, from the Harris government on, home care hours were severely rationed. And uh, if you needed more, you'd have to find volunteers uh, or family um, to, uh, to provide that care. So that's the downloading of work from paid to unpaid labor. And that exists, that continues to this day, even though the McGuinty government announced that it has increased the caps on uh, home care, they have uh, continued to underfund it to such an extent that um, the increasing of the caps don't mean anything. Most people can get an hour three times a week at the very most, and they are now moving patients so fast out of hospital that people require much, much more care than that. So many people hire it in privately if they can afford it, or um, as is part of the criteria for home care, they have to look for volunteers, uh, friends, or family to uh, provide that uh, care. Um, <clears throat> and then the uh, adoption of corporate or modalities, as I'm calling them, in within the public service itself or within the not-for-profit uh, hospital system in particular. And so we've seen the introduction of competitive bidding. Does everyone know what that is? So market, you know, okay, so what it is is um, uh, the not-for-profits and the for-profits will bid against each other for contracts in home care, for example. 
Um, and, uh, and those that meet the price levels, they always say it's about quality, but it never is. They don't actually have quality measures in home care. It happens in people's homes in privacy. Nobody knows what really happens uh, there. So it's all measures of administrative processes, really, and um, price. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that company that bids the lowest uh, gets the contract. And, because, and then the contracts initially turned over every year totally destabilizing the sector. So the company that lost the contract, say it was the Red Cross, laid off all of its nurses and personal support workers. The company that won the contract, of course, didn't have any workers in the area because it had no contract to provide home care. Aimed to hire all of the laid off workers from the previous company, right? But now they're not unionized. They have lower wages, worse working conditions. Um, and then uh, a year later, the contract would turn over again. The instability caused so many problems, such a huge staffing shortage that they actually extended the contracts to then three years, uh, ran competitive bidding every three years. So instead of losing your job every year, you'd lose it every three years. Um, that also didn't work. And now they've had competitive bidding under more two moratoria, uh, but they've frozen it now with the majority, of the, uh, or a large, almost the majority of this, actually it is the majority now of the sector uh, being provided by uh, for-profit uh, corporations. Um, and uh, so competitive bidding, the split between purchaser and provider, this asinine notion that you can't actually provide services as a public service, but you have to have a purchaser and a provider. Um, uh, the notion that hospitals have to create profit centers. For example, we just did a tour of um, 12 communities, 1,150 people came out to public hearings that we held on uh, the future of small and rural hospitals. And what we heard in different communities from the hospitals was, I think, very much evidence of the extent to which this corporate kind of culture has taken over the hospitals. So in Muskoka Algonquin, for example, when referring to the Gravenhurst Diagnostic um, center. The, uh, the hospital CEO said it had to become a profit center or it would be closed down. Um, uh, in Chatham, the hospital CEO said that they had to increase their market share in order to become competitive as a hospital. Competitive um, with whom? The other hospitals. I'll explain that in a second. In King Carden, um, when the community uh, objected to, clo to cutting and privatizing the physiotherapy in that hospital, the local hospital CEO, uh, forced into holding a town hall meeting, uh, informed the community that um, this is a private corporation and that the community was not entitled to financial information from the hospital, including um, you know, how much it costs to run that hospital compared to the hospital that they were trying to move services into. Um, similarly, the Scarborough Hospital CEO, when facing a community fight to stop them from uh, getting rid of the, uh, from um, a number of cuts and trying to take over the democratically elected board. So the hospital responded by completely axing the democratically elected hospital board. And the CEO justified this by saying hospitals are complex, multi-million dollar private corporations and there was no place for democracy in these institutions. Um, and of course, uh, the, this new distinction um, that they have increasingly made over the last decade uh, or so between clinical and non-clinical services, as if you could hive off whole parts of the hospital and privatize them and it doesn't matter. Those services, security, food, cleaning, um, all of the support services, patient records of the hospitals, hospitals could not run without those services. Pretending that they are not, they don't affect patient care is um, simply a myth, but something that has been used to uh, voice privatization. Something that we've seen also sweep um, through the private sector before in terms, in terms of hiving off those jobs in factories and putting them out to competitive bidding. <clears throat> um, and a lot of this is being pushed now by the creation of uh, a crisis in, ter in terms of funding um, not just healthcare, but all of the social services, all of the public services in the province. Ontario now lags behind the rest of the country on a per capita basis and on a, uh, on a percentage of uh, GDP, so percentage of our economic output basis, in spending on social programs, all of our social programs. So that is education, healthcare, um, uh, social security, so poverty um, uh, mitigation, um, environment, 
et cetera. All of the programs and services that government provides. We actually spend $1,700, just over $1,700 less per person in Ontario um, than the average of the rest of the country on those services. And, and um, when it comes to hospitals, the sort of front line of the attack on um, public health care in Ontario, uh, we spend about $200 per person less than the other provinces. And that may not sound like a lot, but when you multiply that by the 13 uh, million people in Ontario, um, what you end up with in hospitals is more than $2 billion shortfall in funding, even compared with the rest of the country. And the way that that has been accomplished in Ontario has been through all of the things that I've described to you, but also a rationing of care that is now becoming um, so um, egregious that, that we just simply cannot uh, allow it to continue. So Ontario now has the shortest length of stay uh, for hospital patients in the country, a day less than um, other provinces. What that means is that our hospitals are forced to get people into and out of the hospital faster than anywhere else. And in traveling the province, when we did the hearings that we did through, throughout the month of March, we heard the consequences of this for people. What it means is rationing care for seniors, largely for seniors. It means moving people out of the hospital before they're ready to go. And in community after community, we heard from distraught family members of people who had been forced out of the hospital when they weren't ready, um, into long-term care homes, in some cases into retirement homes. Um, and then, um, so this would be someone's mother, for example, who's 80-something years old, has dementia, a host of health care problems, too sick, really, for the long-term care home. So then she would end up back in the ER, usually you know, being treated on some stretcher in a hallway because there's no hospital beds left, right, for the rest of her life, which might be then two weeks uh, or three weeks at the most. And, and this was not... Um, this was not an isolated story. These are frequent stories being told all across Ontario. We heard of attempts to close down hospital beds. The idea now is that you close down all of the beds, the seniors' beds essentially, uh, or the, for the people with chronic illnesses. Get them out of hospitals. Hospitals are only supposed to provide acute care, but there's nowhere for them to go. And so what happens, is, so really what they're trying to do is force physicians and nurses into doing, for putting people out of hospital when they know that there isn't adequate care for them, right? Because they haven't been doing that, because they've been allowing them to stay in what they call ALC beds or different types of hospital beds, um, uh, the government has found ways of forcing them to do it by forcing hospitals into competition. And, um, and that has amounted to drastic bed closures. And what happens when you close too many beds in a hospital is that your ICU patients, these are incredibly ill people on the verge of death, right? End up lining up, uh, filling up your extra medical beds. They end up filling up your emergency departments. Um, people then get back, backed up all through the hospital and they end up in stretchers and hallways in the ER, sometimes for days at a time. I mean, we heard of cases where people who had broken a limb in Niagara had to wait six days before, um, before their limb was set. There was nowhere, nowhere for them to go, no way for them to access care. We heard of people waiting for four days in emergency departments in Niagara Falls after they cut uh, uh, the beds. And this is not isolated to Niagara Falls. This is happening across uh, Ontario. Um, and so this rationing of care sort of creates further crisis in hospitals. It leads to um, canceled surgeries, longer wait times, and all kinds of irrationalities in, uh, in care. And this endless squeeze um, uh, by, by, uh, by prioritizing tax cuts over funding public services, by pretending that public services are uh, inefficient on a continual basis, um, uh, has led to more and more and more privatization, cuts, cuts to services, and deterioration of quality and access to care. I just want to show you quickly what hospital competition looks like right now in Ontario. So without ever, like in England, without ever passing any legislation, without um, any democratic debate, without actually making it clear to the public what they're doing, our government has actually created a system on the advice of the Ontario Hospital Association um, to bring in uh, hospital competition. If your hospital is considered inefficient or failing in that competition, 
then you don't get funding bailouts when you're in deficit. If your hospital is considered efficient in that competition, then you do get funding bailouts. So that copies what was brought in in the earlier years in the UK. What this looks like in a hospital is this. Uh, the Peterborough Regional Health Centre, for example, the hospital in Peterborough, is, it just had a peer review and they compared it to other peer hospitals, found it to be inefficient, and, and their, their basic idea is that they want to reduce average length of stay, so how long patients are in hospitals. Uh, so what they do is they uh, chart all of the hospitals. How long patients are in hospital on average has nothing to do with what their need is, just you know, on average how, many, uh, how long the patients are in hospitals. And if you're in the bottom quartile, or the, the two bottom quartiles, so the two bottom quarters, so you have more longer length of stay for your patients, then you have to make cuts to try and make it up into the top quartile. Hospitals are expected to try and make it up into the top quartile. So bear with me for a second, just so you can see how this works. So let's say you're the bottom quartile. You lose, you have the longest length of stay for patients in your hospital. No, no matter that you have long waits in your ER, no matter that all your beds are full, you still have the longest length of stay, right? You, let's say from the middle of the room, from Colin over to here, you're the second bottom quartile, okay? You're, from Colin to here, you would be the second highest quartile, and then you would be the highest quartile, right? You, you have cut all those beds, you've got your ICU patients in the ERs, you've cut your nurses, you've, uh, uh, you know, who cares what the backlogs are, but you are the top here. And um, so you have to cut. So you make all those cuts. You now got patients lining the hallways for days. Who cares? Because you're now in the top quartile. Congratulations. So what happens to you? You're in the second quartile. What happened to you? You're now in the third quartile. What happened to you? You're in the bottom quartile. Okay, so you make all your cuts. You're now in the top quartile. What happened to you? Second. You've dropped a second. What happened to you? Third. Third. What happened to you? Moved Great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have to make cuts. There is no benchmark. There is no uh, measure of what an appropriate length of stay might be. There's no pet measure of uh, quality of care or patient need. There is one measure of quality of care, which is uh, the number of readmissions within 24 hours. Anything after 24 hours isn't actually measured. So if you go to a long-term care home but don't come back into the ER for two days, then it doesn't count as a readmission. But all of the rest of the measures are all about reducing the number of RNs uh, compared to RPNs, reducing the number of staff, reducing the number of beds in various categories, and quickening uh, how you get patients out of hospitals. That has already been imposed in Ontario without the public knowing anything about it, without any um, uh, democratic process for what is a considerable policy change. And this, I think, underlines um, what all of these market modalities are about, because almost all of them are about imposing some kind of competition, usually to enable bringing in the private sector. But the other thing that the Ontario government wants to do is bring in price-based competition within hospitals. And that would see hospitals pricing things like knee surgeries, hip surgeries, eye surgeries, MRIs and CTs and so on. Um, and then um, competing against other hospitals in some way. I think what they intend to do in Ontario is set a central price and then have hospitals have to meet that price. Those hospitals that can't meet the price would no longer provide that service. Those hospitals that can meet this, the set price would increase the amount of that service that they provide. The consequence of that would be that all hospitals shrink the scope of services that they provide. They'd have to specialize on fewer things in order to meet the low price level to, to be able to bid for uh, funding for particular services. So instead of to ascertain this has never first off it's a stupid idea I think it's obvious why it's stupid but the but the other uh, thing is that it's never been tried anywhere that I've been able to figure out with anything like the geography and population distribution of a place like Ontario where you know you've got 13 million people but um, but outside of but there is no transportation system none whatsoever there's not even roads in much of the province um, where hospitals are 100 or more kilometers away from each other, 
uh, in the 100,000 person towns, where the north is, you know, has a very low population. The whole northern, the vast majority of the province has a very low population. And the real trick to providing public health care there is how to provide rural and remote health care services effectively to people, not how to centralize them into specialized hospitals. And even in places like Toronto, which has the best transportation system of the province, um, traveling from one part of the city, it still has a crappy transportation system, frankly, um, yes. you know, without subways. And traveling from one part of the city to another is not easy, and traveling within the GTA is very difficult. So where they've already done this, they've done it in cataracts, and they've done it, started to do it in hips and knees. And so for one example, the North York Hospital uh, decided that it couldn't compete on cataracts, and they sent them up to Newmarket. So all of the elderly people in North York now have to travel up to Newmarket to get their cataract surgeries, right? Obviously you can't drive after you've had cataract surgery. So you have to um, somehow get transportation up to Newmarket and back again to your home. In the GTA, we'd be talking, you know, people traveling from Toronto to Oshawa. It depends on how big they make this. But the idea is they're going to bring it in in Toronto and in Ottawa first, and the large cities, I would expect London and Hamilton, um, and then we'll see it spread across the province. It will be devastating in the 100,000 person towns, the Coburgs, the Peterboroughs, the Kingstons, etc. But it will create real hardship in Toronto and Ottawa and London and, and Hamilton as well when they bring it in. The consequences, well, this is the antithesis of measuring and trying to meet population need for healthcare services. It's the exact opposite. It, it's agnostic as to, to need. It's all based on competition and who can provide the service at a set price or at the cheapest price. It requires patient travel when there is no way to travel from place to place. For example, we priced out some areas. In Niagara, it, it costs uh, $180 to travel across the peninsula from where they closed one hospital to uh, the, the other major hospital in the area. Um, uh, it, it increases, as Colin noted, um, restructuring and administrative costs. So you have, to, you have to renovate all those hospitals as you change services in them. You've got to move the personnel around. You've got to sever people here, uh, hire them over here, et cetera. And in addition to that, it adds all of the administrative costs of bean counting, of measuring the slice of a janitor's time that it takes for one operation, right? The slice of a nurse's time, um, uh, how much electricity, et cetera, in order to price out that procedure and then bid against others. Uh, it puts endless pressure on the global budgets, and particularly the service workers, right? So it pushes the privatization of the service workers, trying to cheapen that, because it puts real pressure on the overhead uh, uh, budgets of hospitals. It forces them to shrink services, and services that don't easily fit into this, mental health, pediatrics, etc., they just uh, really get uh, hurt as more of hospital budgets are moved over into this pricing uh, system. It creates financial instability in hospitals, and it absolutely creates the market for the private sector to bid in. And it would be very, very difficult. We'd have a hundred Allegra's, you know, saying that I can provide knee surgeries cheaper than the Hamilton Hospital, etc. We'd have to research and fight every single one of them. Very, very hard to do once they start to bring in the pricing system. Hospitals, Lynn's, the Ministry of Health would be beset. They already are, but they would be even more beset by. Uh, bids from private sector corporations as they try and bid into um, this uh, system. Um, so we've seen this happen in home care, turns care into something that doesn't reflect uh, what we think of as quality or accessible patient care. And, um, and it really is the beginning of, um, of the total dismantling of the public health care system, I believe. And so we have to fight it. And I think uh, I'm just going to end on saying that we have won significant victories in fighting privatization in Ontario. Um, we've won against major cuts. We forced a uh, stop to the private for-profit cancer treatment center. We stopped the private for-profit uh, MRI CT clinics. Uh, we've rolled back the P3s both in scope and number in a way that hasn't happened in any other jurisdictions that I know of. We've stopped two-tier health care and private clinics um, more than any of the other large provinces, even in Canada. And in Canada, we've stopped it more than uh, in most of the rest of the world. Uh, we can win this by fighting back, but it means, um, it means mass mobilization. People have to know that there's a fight. I think our initial barrier, 
and respecting what you were saying about strategy is that people don't know that there's a fight and we're not going to win unless we can create the fight. If we can create the fight, we can win. And to me, that means moving to mass mobilization as quickly as we can. Thank you. Thank you.